coming to you direct from the nerve center of the galaxy's greatest comic. This is the 2000 AD Thrill Cars. Borag Thung, Earthlets, and welcome to the 2000 AD Thrillcast. We are back, ever so briefly. Sorry for the enforced hiatus over the last few months. Yeah, it's been a busy year. Um, but we are back for a special episode to mark the passing of Judge Barbara Hershey, which took place a, a couple of weeks ago in uh, 2000 AD. And uh, since the follow-up story... Uh, Judge Dread Poison is beginning this week in 2000 AD. I had a nice long chat with Rob Williams and Simon Fraser, the creators behind Hershey, which was the, uh, I, I think I can call it long running series, um, which uh, followed Hershey's uh, journey of revenge as she tried to uh, uh, mop up the last bits of uh, Judge Smiley's organisation. For those of you who haven't read Judge Dread Trifecta and Small House, um, really do recommend you go and get those collections. And, uh, oh, there's 50% off this month uh, with uh, with those. Um, uh, if you also want uh, the Hershey collection, that is available from the 2008 uh, web shop. This is the web shop. Uh, exclusive edition and it's beautifully illustrated by Simon throughout um those of you on uh YouTube a bit useless if you're listening to this but uh, some absolutely stunning uh art by uh by Sai uh, on this series and um uh so yeah the, the series wrapped up in prog um 2349 uh with the final end for one of uh, the longest running supporting characters in Judge Dredd history, Judge Hershey. So uh, it was great to talk to them about the legacy of the character, what it was like um, to bring her story to uh, a close, their thoughts on on the reaction to the series. And um, yeah, a, a really great. It's, it's so wonderful to be chatting with you again. I'm, I'm sorry it's been so long. Um, it, another good uh, point to uh, to start again with the podcast, is because we have a jumping on issue. So if you've never read 2000 AD, if you've not read 2000 AD for a long time, now is the perfect time to start subscribing because it's Prog 2350. That's, that cover is very shiny, um, which uh, has this fantastic uh, John McRae and uh, Mike Spicer uh, cover um, with um, Robo Hunter versus Judge Dredd, which is uh, rather amazing, written by Garth Ennis and drawn by Henry Flint. On your stories uh, in this issue, uh, like I said, new story called uh, Judge Dread Poison, which follows uh, Dread trying to find out who was responsible for for the untimely death of, uh, of Judge Hershey. You've got Feral and Foe by Dan Abnett and Richard Elson. Um, you've also got um, The Return of Helium uh, by Ian Edgington and Israeli. Now, uh, it's been a while since that's been in the prog. So uh, each issue of 2080 uh, of 2051, comes with a little QR code so you can get a free download of the entire book one of Helium from eight years ago, however long it was, uh, because Tharg the Mighty is indeed generous. So, uh, shameless promotion out of the way. Let's get on with uh, the podcasting. So, uh, yeah, it was wonderful to talk to Rob and to Sai about Hershey, um, their feelings on the character, the feelings now that um, the, the series has come to an end, and uh, a tiny little bit of what uh, the future holds. So, um, yeah, strap yourselves in, Earthlets, and uh, let's crack on. So to celebrate, well, celebrate, is that the right word? Uh, to mark this important uh, milestone in the history of, don't look at me like that, um, at the in the history of the Judge Judge Strip, um, we are joined by the executioners themselves, um, Rob Williams and Simon Fraser. Because um, I wanted to get you both on, because uh, Hershey's such an important character in Judge Dredd history, full stop. But also, um, uh, I don't think I'm, I'm exaggerating when I say that, that you've put her through the ringer over the last few years. Um, and I, I just wanted to, uh, I think, in fact, I think I talked to you when the series started back in the mist of time. Um, so I wanted, I wanted to talk to you about how the series has developed, how your um, uh, work on it has developed, how your feelings about it have developed, and 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 now that we come to the end point, to the the death of Hershey, 
um your 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 feelings your emotions um uh, 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 right now but i prefer not to i prefer to see we're the executors of our last will and testament <laughs> i i would just like to say i, I don't feel we're celebrating I mean, well we're, exactly we're, I, I i don't know why i said that yeah we're honor we're honoring her we're yeah. honoring a character who deserves to be honored uh, if for uh, nothing else than her her steadfast devotion to duty which may have been misguided but was still important mm. Well, let's let's refresh some memories. Um, so, back in the midst of time, maybe what three years ago was it? Yeah. It was a three years ago. Yeah. Yes, I would say four. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you uh, you you pitched this idea to to Tharg. Um, uh, John Wagner um, was. Uh, preparing the Guatemala storyline at the time. Um, and in that story, it appeared that uh, that um, uh, Hershey had uh, died from uh, a, a viral infection um, that, uh, that um, she'd picked up. But um, not long after that, the Hershey series starts, um, in which we find out that that, that death was faked. Um, tell us a little bit about that, uh, just to refresh our memories about that um, development process. Well, it, it came about, um, I felt like um, uh, in, in the small house, there's the, the there's basically, I didn't write the Hershey standing, stepping down, but I effectively wrote... I think I sort of I felt like I sort of did for her basically her role as as chief judge, and I, from the midst of time I remember saying to Matt Smith Tharg, um, look, her she's been there a long time as chief judge. I think it's about time she went, and can we get rid of her? And Matt said, "Oh, it's funny you should say that. I think John's got had similar thoughts, and I think John's going to do something with that." So I kind of got the okay if I remember this right I kind of got the okay to not push her off the uh the the edge of the building but certainly poke her towards the edge of the building and then I think John was gonna whatever John did push her off and I kind of felt like what Dredd did to her in saying I no longer recognize your authority in front of in the hall of justice in front of a lot of senior judges was a really horrible thing for Dredd to do to her I mean it's as we've explored a lot in the series. Um, it's kind of it was it was time for it to go, and and Dread felt felt it was time for it to go. But Dread was also being a bit of a. Uh, can I swear on the podcast? Yeah, yeah, by all means. You've been a bit of a camp, basically, at that point. Um, <laughs> wow! Oh wow! I thought you were going to say something like Arsenal. You you went full nuclear. <laughs> well, it's what I was what I was thinking. I mean, but um, uh, well, Dread was being a bit of a bastard, shall we say? If you want to, if you want to cut the other one out. Um, so, and I kind of felt a bit bad for, for the character because genuinely, you know, she, she is a long beloved, um, character in the Dread, Judge Dread world. So I kind of thought it would be kind of interesting to do her, her long walk journey. And I like the idea of, which has been a totem throughout the entire thing of like these characters, they train to be judges and then they are judges and that's it. It's the law. You, you, you know, dread is the law. They are the law, right? It's over. What are you then? What are you left with? And really, I think that's been the overriding idea of the series to sort of to give agency to this woman who she was a judge. She was an amazingly good judge. And then she was a really good chief judge. And then it's the, the race is run. It's over. And it's like, well, who the hell am I? basically and that was the general idea and i think that's what simon and i have been exploring for four seasons series i i, I, I kind of felt like they're seasons because i think we've in in tone and we, we you know i'm doing all the talking so i should talk but we talked a lot about at the start of this we wanted to give it a bit of a different feel to other 2008 AD series and and we were coming in with certain other touchstones which largely came from film and tv and i think tonally i've tried to write it in a in a way which is quite a for what for a shorthand way of putting it a sort of like a prestige drama kind of voice right which sounds wanky but it's also true um and that's the kind of approach that i've I, i've tried to give it in terms of the voice of the piece um anyway i should shut up 
I do love it on a podcast when somebody says I should shut up. <laughs> you know, to this. I think that's a fair thing. I think it's it's interesting because if you talk about I don't know, I was talking in a podcast last night about the mayor of East Town. It's like, what do you do when you've got these great actors, specifically female actors, who are now of a certain age and are no longer like bankable, blah blah blah, but are at the peak of their powers. And in a certain to a certain extent, Hershey is at the peak of her powers as a character, um, but she's not interesting in the conventional sense to uh, uh, an audience who are interested in action adventure, certainly boys own action adventure and older women don't really have a part in that. Uh, the, the erasure of older female characters is quite sh shocking even today. And it is being changed. The situation is changing, but it's like Hershey is a really interesting character. She's got a lot to say. She's put in a situation she's not comfortable with at all. She has to make her own rules, which is something she's never had to do before. She's always lived within a system. Now she's out there in the world and Rob starts to play with this idea and also plays with the idea of her dealing with death, which is not something we ever have to do in 2008, even though Carnage surrounds characters all the time. Nobody actually prepares for death, um, certainly not a female character and certainly not of like effectively old age. I mean, she gets old and dies on this in this story um, on her own terms. Uh, which I think is 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 a, is a radical, interesting thing to do, and I thought that's that's really what was excited me about this thing to do at the start because I don't think it's I've ever seen it done in any comic, never mind two thousand AD, in any comic at all, um, where you get an older female character run the arc of her life out, deal with her legacy, and try and make amends or try and at least die with some honor and nobility. It's it was fascinating to me, and I've never I I it, I really. Thank you, Rob, for giving it to me. I, it's a real pleasure to do. I'm really interested in this in this aspect of, of the the nature of the end of a character's journey because, as you said, you know, death death in comics is not the end um, uh, to the point where, particularly with something like X Men comics, they they actually make a feature of it. You know, mm. somebody dies and like, well, they'll you know they'll be they'll be back at mm. some point. Um, so I know there was some grumbling. Uh, about the fact that John had written quite a, a gentle, pathos-driven um, ending for, for for Hershey, but then along you know along comes this series, which is is quite harsh and quite um, full on. And Sai, I know that, and it'd be great to talk you know for for you to explain a bit about this that how Hershey has aged over the course of those four um stories um not just in terms of the fact that she is getting on mm -hmm. uh, and he's getting older but the fact that she is dying from this from this disease as well generative condition yeah. yeah so she's aging and aging plus yeah, uh, yeah i yeah. think it's interesting because 2008 has been good about this we dread has aged technically in real time even though he's being de-aged but i think i mean something i've been aware of drawing him in this story for the little bit that i did was i want him to look old i want mm. him to look beaten and broken and old but he's still holding it together but he's still there's a, there's a cost there's a cost to all of this and we really don't get to see it as much in dread as we should to my mind um but hershey we can show it because we know where she's going um so i want to see the cost of that responsibility and the cost of that life and the cost of you know just doing business as a, a law enforcement officer in this chaotic world so she I've drawn on her face, it's on her body, it's in how, how she functions with chronic pain, which is in the back of my head all the time as she moves through the story. It's like, she is in chronic pain. She's taking medication, but not as much as she probably should mm -hmm. uh, because that's not who she is. Um, she's someone who expects pain and deals with it internally. Um, and she inflicts, unfortunately, on that pain on other characters around her. And that in the story is Frank, mostly. Um, but other people too. She's not a nice person, and it's because of what's happening to her. Um, and I, I want, I wanted to see that because I've never seen it. You know, I've not seen that in any other comic, not even in any, any other comic. I, just, I should point out, like in the last episode, if, if people are watching this, they probably mm -hmm. read. Like a doctor says to her, "This medication you've been on is incredibly strong, and yeah. one of the side effects are depression and suicidal thoughts." And then that is actually a to me, a reveal of a lot of what, how she's been through the three series. She's been on this incredibly powerful medication. And anyone you know who 
there's always so you know I've I've got a friend who's dealing with sort of a heavy medical condition and I guess given pills and lo and behold suicidal thoughts are <laughs> you yeah. know he's put people have deal, got enough to deal with anyway and they give them pills to make them better and the pills actually make them feel suicidal so that is sort of partly influences some of I think Hershey's actions throughout but not all of them but some of them I mean is it she's not this is the thing with female characters they they're they're drawn to please a male audience and she's been deliberately drawn in this case to not She's on her own, doing this on her own terms. She's doing her own journey. Uh, she's not trying to appeal to anybody at all, except trying to justify herself. And to what Rob says, I mean, I'm, I'm at the beginning of the year, I moved into this house with uh, my mother-in-law, who's downstairs in the apartment in the basement, uh, who is now 82 and is heavily medicated a lot of the time and has to deal with health issues of her own and inevitably is facing her own mortality in a very immediate way. Um, and we talk about this all the time. So her, her journey informs Hershey's journey too. Um, if I get to dedicate a book at the end of this, it would be dedicated to her. Um, because it's a lot to do with a life and how you live a life and how you end it and how you resolve how you resolve that issue, these issues which are complicated. Um, and and it's 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 fascinating to me. I mean, I'm mm. only in my 50s, but you know, death is a factor. Now, you know, we we all have somebody we know close to us who's died, almost certainly, um, jo unexpectedly. Join us, thrill seekers. For right. <laughs> and it's like, yeah, no, let's no, deal with it. Let's deal with death. I mean, yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm constantly reminded of like, the, I'm, you, you're all Buffy fans, right? Mm. Um, there's Buffy, the vampire slayer, killing death constantly starting. And then there's the one episode of the body where Buffy's mom dies. And it, they suddenly have to deal with actual death. Mm. And um, it's like, oh, this is a big subject. In fact, it may be one of the biggest subjects you ever deal with. And I mean, it's, like, this, it's something this, this, we don't do. This is something I saw uh, someone talking about online um, uh, in relation to the, the 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 nature of linear time within the dread story, because everyone holds it up as a positive. You know mm. that it's not um, it's not just a constant merry-go-round where time uh, uh, and and death have no meaning. Right. But this this person possibly the the in theory people want that. <laughs> and and praise it as a positive, but but do they really? Well, or do, they, know, do they do they want to still like see in front of you? Yeah. I mean, in fairness, we did. I should also point out all these things we've said are true, and things I think are, we're both quite proud of with the series. We knew we were kind of heading into the wind with a lot a lot of it, you know. Um, but um, we did also do some amazing action stuff in there. I mean, we've got like the best transfer stunt in comics. <laughs> ever i think in like no one like her jumping from a hover bike onto a giant roadster going across the arctic plateau and it was just like yeah let's do it let's do a transverse and no one does that in comics so <laughs> um so there's there's a lot and dirty frank's always fun there's some good there's always I really i really wanted to do a, a panel or two after that stunt where she's in the cab going, yeah. fucking hell. She, she really should be, because we get, yeah, yeah. We, we've got an aging Hershey doing the best yeah. stuff. And I'm like, no, this is, this, this is going to hurt. This yeah. would hurt someone in their 20s. <laughs> I mean, to, be, to, to be quite frank, as somebody in his mid-40s, a light jog um, yeah. uh, produces uh, extreme mm. uh, heavy Climbing breathing. Climbing my stairs. You know, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but again, I, I to, to flatter him, so he's done some amazing work in this, in this series throughout. And, and sort of, We've kind of, yeah, and tonally, like a lot of it, we talked about the cinematography of it and the colouring, and so that shouldn't be ignored. I think so a lot of it, you know, it's very deliberately not your normal 2000 AD series, and I think um, uh, Sai deserves, um, uh, what's the opposite of a thrill sucker? Well, I, I think it's uh, probably illegal in several countries. I, I, well, I, I, uh, 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 oil ration, more oil rations. More oil rations. He needs yeah. many more oil rations, I think, for his work. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I think the pay rate was the standard one, but uh, yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> I just work in marketing. Oh, just... Well, exactly what the Nazis said. Uh, uh, well, yes. I work in marketing. Well, yes, yes. <laughs> well, that was, Goebbels, that was Goebbels, wasn't it? <laughs> Joseph Goebbels. I, I work in that's, that's, a, that's a line from my Eagles there that I don't remember. Uh, I just work in the marketing. <laughs> and then Clippy <laughs> and just shoots it. Yeah. Kills the entire marketing mm. department. Don't <laughs> 
Yeah, I mean, quite so. Let's let's not go down that route because oh. that's 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 how you end up um, getting fired. Um, but it would, uh, one one thing that, that I did want to pick on from what you said, Rob, with you know, talk uh, thinking about this this series in terms of the touchstones being film and TV, because Sai, you, you, it you very clearly consciously had a specific way of doing color um, uh, with 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 Hershey, and for me, what it evoked actually was. Um, you know, we used to get annuals, like comic book mm, annuals, yeah. and they'd be yeah, printed yeah, yeah. in two colours, black and like gr- random green or, or red, red or something. Yeah, and it, it, yeah. it causes no end of problems for our reprographics team when they're scanning in old comics and the the, the page on the back yeah. has, has used like blue ink and it just so, it's mm. it's seeped through the page onto the opposite. But anyway, um, but it, and it just, it just felt like a, a very noir way of doing it, that you're dealing in kind of, uh, tones rather than attempting a kind of well, well, originally it was going to be drawn black and white i was uh, i was commissioned to do the, the story in black and white mm. and i said well i want to do black and white and a tone and it, because i wanted to use tonal values it's interesting yeah. it was interesting to me at the time because i was this is one of the first not the first thing i've done full digital but it's one of the where i wanted to kind of stretch it a bit a little bit and i thought if i'm doing a tone there's no reason why that tone can't be a color that gives me an extra storytelling tool and it's like well that's means that I could probably color this whole thing um, without, you know, having to hand it over to somebody else, because I've had Gary Caldwell coloring my stuff brilliantly for years. Um, and I thought, that's interesting. And I said, like, how, how can I do it? So I tried it out a little few times. And I said to Matt, I want to try this. If it doesn't work, we can just do it black and white. It's not a problem. All right, just pay me for black and white. No big deal. And Matt said, yeah, I really like how this is going. And he gave me a uh, commensurate pay rise to go with the, the fact that I was doing coloring as well. Um, and I thought it was, it's really an interesting thing because normally you hand the coloring off to somebody else and you, if they're a good colorist, like Gary is, then you get a lot back, but using the coloring specifically only as a storytelling tool, um, gives you an extra tool to work with, gives you an extra, an extra weapon in your arsenal, which was really interesting. Because I could draw attention to things, I could focus things, I could change the mood of a page by changing the color. Um, I can change from one page to another, and I can also um, echo locations. So there's a lot of location that so I Arctic bunker, which is the, the kind of horrible sickly red color. And every time you come back to that, you've got a horrible sickly red color, and people suffer in there, and you've got that color, and it's like I hate that color. But it's part of the game. It's like you throw that color in people's face, and it's like, um, and that's. That's an emotional tool. Um, so I'm like, I'm really quite enjoying it. Um, added to the fact that it's now that like the only thing I've, I've done, which is all colored, all by me, all the artwork is controlled by me from beginning to end. And I am a control freak because um, I've been doing basically touch up work on Gary's stuff for years because Gary and I pass stuff back and forward. That's why it works so well because there's always communication between the two of us. Um, but this time I just, I did it all myself because control is my thing um and I, i'm very happy with how it came out i'm happy that people responded well to it because it wasn't a given i thought people would just go oh, it's like old annuals i fucking hate it um because fair um it is it is a kind of a cheat in my side in my part because it's not proper color but it is storytelling color so it gave me more tools so i hope it made the story better in terms of of the kind of overarching um storyline for, for for the series was this always going to be the end point was was this what you had in mind or or was it how we got to this point where Hershey finally dies was that always up in the air uh, I don't think so I think it I think it um I forget everything I've written um uh five seconds after I've, I've written it so that's a problem I feel like I'm heading down a David St Hubbins role because um I <laughs> Uh, from Spinal Tap, in terms of my vagueness, um, I think it, I thought it was important that she. I just really wanted her to go in a way that was not, again, not your normal comic death. Basically, I didn't. You know, I felt like the way she goes is so um, um, just low key and just. I think it's. I really like it. I mean, it's just basically, it's nothing overly dramatic or pompous. It's like it's trying to do her duty, even though she's in a terrible physical state and there's a really mundane burglary 
and she chases some perp down a back alley and she just and 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 but one of the last things she says is citizen get inside it's not safe which i think is um is 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 a, a we right. had a conversation yeah. about a much more grandiloquent or much more glorious ending but in actual fact what i think will happen was much better but we talked about her coming back to mega city one basically to overthrow the justice system which wouldn't really work yeah but it would have been fun <laughs> well, there <laughs> but was it doesn't a, it's not the story there was a, and there was a pitch at one point you've reminded me of her basically setting up an antarctic city as as you know a, a, her taking over as proper chief judge and mm -hmm. basically Mega City One turning up and kind of going, you can't do this. And her effectively kind of going to war with Mega City One. And that got passed on. I think that's a good thing that it got passed on. I think where we ended up was a lot smaller and was a lot more personal and was a lot more about character more than anything bombastic. Yeah. Um, and in fact, we kind of, the last series, we set up this big sort of, you know, there's this big sort of, Enceladus um, spider plague, which could spread out, which is a very 2000 AD kind of, you know, big sort of high concept danger. And we shut that down about halfway through the last series uh, very quickly. And just the last few episodes are just purely about character. And I love that stuff. I mean, basically, that to me was was what it was all about. It was always a character piece. Um, and um, so it felt right that she... She goes out the way she goes, as opposed to, you know, fighting a giant dinosaur or something like that. Although that would be fun, too. <laughs> we'll do that in the Christ the Hershey Christmas special. <laughs> I'm announcing here. <laughs> Where everybody sits around a fire and talks, tells stories about her. Mm. Oh, we could do that. One of the things I, I did want to ask about, was, was, and you've mentioned it already, this relationship with Dread. Yeah. And how um because she's she's always and I, I I'm not maligning her here, but she's always been slightly in the shadow of dread. I mean, there was that brief period in the 90s when she got her own um spin-off series. Um, but by and large, her appearances have, have been in the Judge Dread stories. Hmm. So right from when she was a, a, a fresh young judge, um, all the way through to uh uh to um the end of her time as as chief judge and even her fake you know her, her fake death um and it, it it feels like you and and also al uh al ewing have been kind of needling away at this relationship mm. a little bit uh sort of over the last uh, uh decade and a half um was 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 that intentional or, or or did you was she just a convenient foil for dread doing what he wanted to do I think Al did a did a really good line somewhere. I forget exactly the wording of it, but it was something like where she faced down dread and basically said, um, you know, you you you're too you're too cowardly to to ever take on the chief judge role. You like coming in here and sort of, you know, throwing your weight around. But so, you know, shut up or put up if you want the job, take it. It was along those lines. That was the 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 you know, beats of the scene. And I and, and that was really interesting and cool. Um, but no, I think the thing is, it's just like I think I read somewhere about someone said about the Hershey thing. Oh, that she, um, you know, she hates dread in this year. She doesn't, she doesn't. I mean, basically, right? Here's the thing it's a family relationship, effectively, mm. and a lot of family relationships are complicated. At times, people drive you around the bend, and you can, then you love them, uh, you know, and they can absolutely drive you mad, and you can be really angry with them. But you still kind of still have that kind of connection. I think that's that's what Percy and Dread are. And even at the end, you know, she gets some kind of. I didn't think it was right that she could be a human being, and Dread could effectively do what he did to her in terms of the, um, uh, you know, I no longer recognize your authority, and effectively just end her career and her life that she'd known, and her not be hugely angry towards it. And I didn't think the dread saying to her, you know, that was a mistake, and her going, okay, yeah, that's not particularly what how human beings work. Mm. So I think an awful lot of her relationship with dread, but we've seen occasionally right at the start of the first series and right at the end, is is her anger towards him. But I think they come out at a place of, um, you know, 
I think she gets she gets what she needs at the end, basically, from her from seeing Dread again. I think it was important. It felt important that she should see Dread one last time. Um, and uh, I think she walks away from that with with a, with a sense of peace because basically, if someone has done something that bad to you, it's it's going to gnaw away at you at some point. You have to kind of go. You have to call them on it, basically. Otherwise, you'll. So, and I think she gets that basically. And it's 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 part of the. She's quite unwilling to unpick the system. Mm. She's been involved with this. She's devoted her life to this. Dread embodies it, and as much as he's behaved like a dick to her, which he has, and he behaves like a dick to a lot of people, he is a physical embodiment of the system. And if she she's she has to accept it. Because I think I think maybe the system's a lot more fragile than most people would like to accept. And if dread's not there, what is there? Um, if he can hire and fire chief judges at whim, a position he doesn't really want, I think I don't know. Um, but it it means that he's much more integral to the system than probably most people would be happy about. Um, and she knows it, he knows it, and a few other people probably understand it. Um, but it's it's a very fragile position and maybe leading on to other stories in the future it's like it's it's a much more pre precarious position than you would like to think well there's there's that line I, I can't remember whether it's in the penultimate episode or the final episode of this series where uh, you know the, the uh, I, I don't know whether she's saying it out loud or whether she's thinking it and where you know she made a mistake with judge smiley mm. and chief judge logan is going to make a mistake yeah because when you're in that, when when you're at the top, <laughs> when when you've got that sign on your desk that says the book stops here, the book stops there. So if if you, when you make a mistake, it is exponentially bigger than any other mistake any other person can make. I, it, there's 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 a line from the 17th century sermon that I once read. Um, it says, you know, great men do greater harm by their decisions because they are great men. Mm. And by the very nature of that they are great men, those great decisions will have bigger ramifications. So you kind of can't uh, 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 avoid that. And But it's so fascinating because so many of the big decisions that Dredd has made have been terrible mistakes. Hmm. You know, you, you've only, you, you, I mean, you know, this is something that, Rob, you, you've, you've played with in, in, in some of your stories, um, where the ramifications of the end of the Apocalypse War just keep coming and they keep coming and they keep coming. And and so he has the power to make the decisions, but he's not necessarily the person who's going to pay. No, because he's, I mean, at the end of the day, he's the ultimate alpha in that world, yeah. basically. And the, and the alphas tend to largely sort of, um, you know, he survives on strength and force of will and all these things. But I think there's, I, I wrote a line in one of the stories, I forget where someone says to him, because you're not a thinker. And he's not. He's just like, he, he shouldn't be making, he's not the smartest man in the world, is Red. Do you know what I mean? But he is, at various times, pretty much through force of will alone, has kept kept them alive. But it's like, there is, I mean, it's impossible, you know, the, the chief judge's role is impossible. It's it's managing, it's it's managing a city that's just... Oh, I wonder if, in effect, Omega City One is a constitutional monarchy. The the government exists there, and then you've got Dread, who stands apart from it and imposes consistency. So whatever happens with the chief judge and the council, Dread's still still there, and everyone just goes, "It's okay." Dread's still there, mm. so we have a we have the king. The king is is there. Well, even when when the dead man step, I mean, you know, then they replaced him, didn't they? With mm. um, uh, was it Kraken? Was it? Yeah. I mean, effectively, kind of went. Oh, look, everyone dreads still here, you mm. know, because it's like he's a totem esque kind of yeah. figure for for but, like the system. The system is still in place because dreads mm. still here, even though it wasn't actually dread, and then and it all went to hell. Well, uh, then then you start kind of getting into into kind of Hobbesian. Leviathan territory of you know you 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 have the terrible Leviathan mm -hmm. who holds it all together, um, but everything else is a system that supports that. And you know, it, it, I, I mean, I've I've done it. You know, referring to the chief judge as bureaucrat in chief, right? You know, but but actually, there is that because it, and I think that was part going back full circle. That was part of the reason why I I think I emailed Matt um, saying. Well, her, she's been there too long when she was chief judge because I was fed up with 
either writing scenes or reading other people's scenes were her. She was in an office looking at an iPad. And there was, and, and I, but I think if you think about what a chief judge would be, that's the chief judge's job. Do you know yeah. what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Like, Here's more that's paperwork, right. and it's like going, Oi. you know what I mean? It's just, <laughs> I don't think I've ever written the line, Oi. I don't think a chief judge has said that, but it's still fine. <laughs> But, I mean, it's it's relatively unusual uh, in comics to have a, 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 a supporting character, which you know, fundamentally she she has been for, for for most of the time, who has evolved piecemeal mm. to mm. become such an uh, still an integral part of the world. You know, it, it, I mean, I, you know, Anderson got a solo spin off series you know within within a matter of a couple of years um whereas despite that that brief sojourn in the magazine in in the 1990s her she has remained in the background and yet her character development has just kept going and going and going you know john in the 90s kind of pushed her forward um when you had all the the democracy stuff and and the the, the referenda the rights and all that stuff yeah, yeah and and um uh the when magruder uh fell um uh, and all this that, and the other even even through uh, you know garth's tenure like she was um there's that scene in judgment day where she's kicking ass uh against the zombies so she's always there but then but then this character has just kind of formed piece by piece do, do, do you think there's the, the to a degree there's there's an organic feel to a character like Hershey and and that's why lots of people have a lot of affection for her because they feel as if they've watched her change and grow and develop over time yeah but I think that's the nature I mean look I mean it's it's you know predominantly John but all these characters are piecemeal because you know a lot of people have written dread and drawn dread and 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 it's it's it, there is no you know and it just we all take what's gone before and add our own little bit and then you know it's um but it's um i mean there's a lot to be said for the fact that when she first turned up she was drawn by bolland and she just looked incredible i mean you know what i mean so i think to a lot of sort of readers of a certain age that had an effect but dreads yeah, the core cast don't tend to hang around long they tend to die and she hasn't until now <laughs> i think that's the thing it's like dread needs an equal there has to be someone he can talk to as an equal. And she's as close to an equal as he's had. I mean, he's Anderson is a little bit more a weirder situation, but Hershey has been there all the way through, consistent figure, consistent presence in the Justice Department, symbolizing normality, the system working, functioning correctly. Um, so I don't know what's going to happen now. I mean, who, who does Dredd talk to now? He's increasingly isolated. I mean, does he need someone? Does he need a confessor? Does he need someone to I actually think he needs, find out? I think he, there's a few. I mean, there's not many people there. I think he truly kind of trusts. And and mm. uh, you know, I, I played a, a around with a bit with that with a small house with that little gang he put together. There was like there's not that was a feeling of of here's some a few people that I respect. You know what I mean? And then I mean, he'll, he, he can always then he'll talk now as well. So. <laughs> <laughs> he can he can always talk to himself because there's literally clones of himself walking walking around. Right. Yeah, maybe that's that's the that's the way to go. Maybe the council of dreads, just like <laughs> get together in a cafe, an abandoned cafe, and sort of like stare at each other's chins. Um, he, he, he yeah, needs... it's, it's 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 a factor. It's like there's going there has to be something to be considered going forward. Is like who does dread talk to? Because he's now very very old. He's seen more history than anyone else. Um, the people who are like running the shop are, you know, decades older, than, younger than him, mm -hmm. um, which is, you know, it's well, something we all face in lots of ways. It's like, oh, shit, everyone's, these are all children. Um, what does he do? How does he handle that? I mean, as much as Dread has emotional needs, um, there has to be some kind of hint of it. Just a touch. Just a touch I to suspect what he'll do is he'll internalize all those feelings and then they will show in some form of brutality towards the populace. Well, I, that's quite my I, thing. I, I think it's fascinating that that when we're talking about Hershey, our conversation keeps coming back to dread. Right. Right. Yes. And and that I mean that that, that that is that is fascinating because it organically does that. Mm. And it's such a metaphor for 
her as a character that that she has always been overshadowed. You know, from a from a very first um, beginnings all the way through um, to her uh, her end. She has been. She can't get away from the the great shadow of this mm. character. I mean, is, is that part? Is that part of the tragedy of of Hershey? That that's that's her great strength. Is that right. she's actually allowed to die. Dread doesn't, in storytelling terms and in commercial terms. Yeah, <laughs> you can't kill the fucker, uh, but Hershey gets to die on her own terms. Mm. So she gets that out. Uh, I wonder if Anderson will be allowed to die at any point. That'd be interesting. I don't want to draw it, but um, it'd be interesting. I wonder if Anderson will be allowed to age. Well, that's even more interesting. Well, a bit, but, but I mean, but this is this is what we were talking about earlier, which is um, the the different pressures on these characters. So yeah. you know, everybody wants them to age, but but do, yeah. do people really want no. them to age? Because um, you know, Arthur Ranson started drawing her older and older and older, but still maintaining a certain kind of you know mm. uh look to her and then you're asking uh artists who are coming in may- maybe on like a you know four-parter or a five-parter to then start drawing those issues in the 60s while she's doing all this acrobatic stuff and so you've got these these multiple pressures w- 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 which is it to be is it to be the linear timeline in which death is inevitable mm. and everybody ages and everybody slows down like I, I don't think I'd, I'd want to read, you know, Anderson teaching at the academy stories. No. Um, no, but the thing, this is the thing about 2000 AD, which is its blessing and to a certain extent a curse, mm-hmm. is that there's very loose hand on the tiller, by and large. Um, creators run with ideas, mostly John Wagner, but other creators too, um, and and the ideas develop and mature over decades, and we all deal with whatever comes to us in our own way. And editorial are, are generally speaking, open to anything, any idea. They do not impose structure. We don't have a, an overarching structure of where this is going. It's just going to evolve naturally, which is an amazing privilege to have, frankly. Um, and it's what allows this story to happen, um, that Hershey gets to die on her own terms, more or less. That's a remarkable thing. That's not going to happen in Marvel or DC. Uh, no, no, no bloody way. Um, so it's it's it's... I don't know. That's the thing. We can't tell what's going to happen. At some point, people are going to die and creators are going to shuffle off this mortal coil and different creators what? are going to take what? over. What? I know. Whoa, whoa, whoa. I, know. Back up, I, will, I will send you flowers when you die. Or you do the same. Uh, yes. But we're going to have to accept that we're not the final hands on this character. And yeah. probably we'll, there will never be final hands on Dread because he's worth too much money. <laughs> we, what were your emotions doing that last episode i mean rob you've already said that you don't remember <laughs> i've forgotten <laughs> it entirely I, I genuinely i was sent you sent me the pdf and i said i've largely forgotten what happens in the last episode mm-hmm. and I, because of my goldfish memory i was actually quite touched when i read it <laughs> um which is nice right? um, but um i don't know i just i genuinely i don't i genuinely don't don't really didn't have a huge feeling on it i think i felt a little bit of relief because it's been four series and it felt like it had a finite end and i felt like right with it felt right to do it there um i wanted to do right by the characters um yeah that was that was kind of it really you just um yeah, I thought it was a sad way for her to go, and I felt this should have been a sad way to go. You shouldn't if you if it's a kind of beloved character, they shouldn't go, and you can go, hooray! You know what I mean? It it should be. Sad. I cried. I cried. I cried when she was standing on the dock when she was saying goodbye to Frank. Yeah, and I think the line that me. when she said, um, "When she says you're dismissed," um, yes, I right. choked. I choked. That, I, I, that gave me a chill right now. Mm. Yeah, that. Um, that's a good line, and, and Dirty Frank, Dirty Frank hugging her, which in in a sense is very very Dirty Frank, and her saying judges don't hug, and Frank saying Dirty Frank is something of an outlier. I thought I loved that scene, all of it, and even actually, I saw I, I one thing I don't know if it was in the script, it was you, Frank. I noticed walks up the gangplank and doesn't look back, and Janino looks back, yes. and I thought that was nice uh, as well. Right. That so that that, yeah. that scene is um. 
Yeah, that's a that's a that's a cracker. I'm quite proud of that. It's interesting because it's Frank basically carries the emotional weight of the whole story, really. Um, unlike usually female characters are the ones expected to do the emotional labor, it's Frank. Frank does all of it. Mm -hmm. Um, and he's he understands that and he carries it brilliantly um in his own weird chaotic way. Um and she needs him. And yeah, he needs I, her. He needs I think her they've too. been they've been they've been through a lot together. And it's like that 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 scene between them is um I think in a way they've saved each other's they even though she dies, in a way they've saved each other, I think. Um, what's next for Frank, Rob? Don't know. But um but also I'd like to point out I just thought someone needs to give after all she's been through, someone needs to give her a hug. She deserves a hug. You know what I mean? And it's not a very judge. And people will go, well, judges don't hug, which is precisely what she says. But I think the underlying theme of this entire thing is she's a human being. That, that, that may have been the first hug she ever got in her whole life. Exactly. Exactly. Which is and horrible. Judges, judges don't get hugs. You no. know? So um, imagine a, an abusive system like that. Mm. Um, and what it produces, but, produces but that's, that's the like whole Hershey. point of the academy of law right is to is to bleed such emotions and such human frailties out of people so that they can do, go and do the most brutal and awful things to their fellow human beings so the minute they feel a point of empathy as you know dread has proven many many times mm. is catastrophe for them mm. so it's a system of abuse yeah yeah, yeah absolutely yeah so in a way, it's the, just yeah. I don't know. I just thought even then she can't she can't she can't say emotions at the end. So she says you're dismissed. You know. But it, she... it's but the th the thing about the whole story is it's a story of revenge, and and that in its in of itself is an emotional response. Yeah. To something. So you know it it. it that's it, how judges. That's how judges express emotions. Yeah. yeah. Carnage. Yeah. At the end of book two, it was that was the th the. You know, that's not, and Frank calls her out on it. She's not a judge at this point. This is revenge, mm -hmm. you know, and yeah. he's gone to it. That's the point where she goes right to the edge. And, but then she does all books three and four the, in Antarctica mm -hmm. is her pulling, pulling back, you know mm -hmm. what I mean? And coming back to a sense of peace because she mm -hmm. goes to, a, she goes to a bad place. Um, yeah. Very bad place. And Frank does too, as well, in his own. Horrific way. Yeah, that's another thing. Simon drew the most horrific page in the history of 2000 AD, but let's not talk about that. No, let's talk about it. It's a podcast. <laughs> oh, we don't have to see it. Oh, okay. That's all right. Yeah, that was like, I think I, I wrote the sort of like, with the with people I'm read it, this sort of, Frank's got this terrible alien infection inside him and this, this, Dodgy doctor basically says he can pull it out of him, but it then and then um and it you is know, all the available orifices of all available orifices, and then the, I wrote that, and then when I saw the page, I kind of went, "Oh dear me!" <laughs> Didn't think this through, did you? <laughs> Didn't think this through. These people are sick, um, and should be stopped. I wrote <laughs> an angry letter to Tharg. Good. I was just happy I got to do the thing. Oh, it was the yeah, but, oh, like let's not give our, logical let's not give conclusion. Blatant thieving secrets. So. I know, I know. <laughs> but listen, if you're going to steal from the best, steal from the best. Yeah, I mean that's, that's that's been British comics' thing for many years. Oh, is you know if you're going if, if if you're going to rip something off, rip off Jaws. Yeah. Oh God. Oh my God. I saw the the shark is broken the other day. It was amazing. Have you seen that? No. Oh, I saw it in it's in New York at the minute. Isn't it's it? in yeah. New York. It's on Broadway right now. Uh, I don't know if you've you've heard of it. So, so um. Ian Shaw, son of Robert Shaw, uh, was looking into some of his because he died as his father died when he was quite young. Yeah. Um, he's now the same age as his dad was when he was shooting Jaws. So he was calling up the only person still alive from that shoot, which who was Richard Dreyfus. And Dreyfus just said, I don't want to talk about it. It was the most horrible experience. And he's going, Oh, what happened? So he gets all the information back and he basically writes a play about it, starring himself as his dad, and he looks uncanny. Um, and there's a two act, one actor, actor doing Roy Scheider, the other doing Richard Dreyfus, and they are so pinpoint on. You forget that you're not looking at Richard Dreyfus, and they basically spend like an hour and a half, two hours on his, on the on the ship on the Orca, talking about in between shots, talking about the shit that's going on in their lives and who they are. And uh, fair play, uh, Shaw is portrayed as a bit of a dick, um, 
and Dreyfus is also portrayed as a bit of an asshole. And Roy Scheider's in the middle going, um, you guys are crazy. Um, yeah. It's very good. It's very fun. I would, I, would, I would like to say, yeah. It was, when he was in London, a friend went, and I, I would like to see it, but I haven't. Um, it, but there, I saw a clip from Robert, we were going off track, but I saw a clip from Robert Shaw on, on Twitter just rolled around, and he was on the talk show, and he was going, uh, my father committed suicide when I was 13 or something. And he go, oh, well, that that rather explains uh, a, a certain amount. But there is also, before we move back on, there's a really good documentary about, on the same tack, about um, uh, Richard Harris at the moment with his three sons trying, mm -hmm. to, um, trying to track down, like, his dad's, their dad's history. And again, Richard Harris is just, like... I mean, good luck. Amazing. Good luck to that. that. I saw Jared and Foundation recently. He looks so much like his dad now. It's crazy. Yeah. It really does. But that's very good. I think it's called The Ghost of Richard Harris. And that's yeah. what I'll have to look at that one because he's an amazing character. Mm -hmm. And these guys, these big old old monsters of the theatre of the stage in Britain of that age, where they basically drank and smoked and did whatever the fuck they wanted and behaved like monsters. And that's what they were expected to be. And drive the thing about the play is that Dreyfus totally hero worships Shaw. Um, and Shaw just couldn't care less about Dreyfus, just delights in torturing him. Right. Um, so I'm watching this and think, I wonder when Dreyfus saw it. I'm going, maybe Dreyfus has never seen this, and maybe he will never see this because this is well, awful there, to watch. There is a there is a clip, um, which is probably connected with this, which Dreyfus on an Irish talk show, I think you probably found mm -hmm. it on YouTube, and I think Robert Shaw's granddaughter they bring mm. out robert shaw's granddaughter if i remember right mm. and dreyfus just bursts into tears mm. and kind of goes i had the most complicated relationship with your grandfather you know and then you're there going jesus it's just like calm down richard dreyfus um uh, but um, very very complicated yes plainly it had an effect on the man put it yeah. yeah anyway yeah. So, amazing anyway hershey dead hello we've segued we have no, 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 no. Rambling is good. Rambling is good. <laughs> um, I mean, I, I, I now that now that it's happening, or by the time this podcast comes out, um, it it will have happened. Are you are you keen to see people's reaction to it, or is it a case of it's done? We've done what we wanted with it. I, uh, here's the thing, right? You do this long enough, you read some of your stuff and you kind of go, eh, and you read some of your stuff and you go, that could be better and you see the flaws. And there's been a bit of that along the way in Hershey. I thought the first two series, there were things I was like, yeah, and from my point of view, I was kind of, a lot of good stuff, some stuff I didn't like. Yeah. Um, I, the last few episodes, the last, the last two series, I think, I genuinely think are really good. And then I think by the end, I think it gets really good, and I it would be quite nice if people read that. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? On a basic level, um, it's like one of those things. I read the last episode, and I kind of went, "Yeah, you know, happy with that." So, on the odd occasion you genuinely feel like that, you kind of think it would be nice if more. He's not happy, Welshman. Sorry, I was like, no, no, it's all relative. I mean, <laughs> it's me, right? But um, yeah, I think it's, I think it's some good stuff. So it'd be nice if people read it. I, I thought, I mean, in terms of the artwork, I'm very happy with it. I think it's the best thing I've ever drawn, um, because I was getting comfortable with the tools, and I feel I'm very happy with the expression of the story. As a story, I think it was very powerful and important to do. I think the feedback has been complicated. Um, and to a certain extent, I've distanced myself from it because I don't care what you think. I'm going to do this. We're going to do this story right. And I think it was very important to do it, to, to do honor to the character, to do the story in the as committed way as possible and just ignore the audience feedback as much as possible. Um, because I think the audience is used to being given what they want. And I don't think they need to get given what they want. I think they need to give them, give them what they need. And I think Hershey's what they need, I see, in my arrogant, artistic way. Um, so fuck you guys. We don't we, care. We, we, we've gone back to Spinal Tap again, where they kind of go, uh, they were still booing him when we were on stage. That's what we're doing. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's been, 
I think at a certain point I've distanced myself from it and says, this is a thing I need to do. And fuck all of you guys. I don't care. We're going to do this right. And in terms of your um, working relationship um, together, because I mean, four books or something is not to be sniffed at. Um, has that evolved? Has that changed? Have you found yourselves second guessing each other or or butting heads on things? Well, I mean, basically, with I, I sort of not talking out of school, we um, considering I, I always think Simon and I get on very well. There's been very little um, dialogue throughout. <laughs> I mean, this is the nice thing about working with Rob is like, I don't need to say anything. It's all there. He puts everything on the page. I feel it as I'm reading it. This is something I, I have a problem with. I, I, I have read a lot of scripts over the years. And a lot of the time, even good writers. And I'm like, I don't care about any of this shit. Why am I reading this? Why am I drawing this? And I feel I get into like a weird spiral of like self-doubt and self-loathing. I hate myself. Never with Rob's scripts. Always Rob's are always great. No problems. I understand the emotional core of it. I know why I'm doing it. I understand the characters. And I understand exactly what they need to feel at any given time. And I don't need to ask him questions because it's all there. It's an amazing thing. He's a very good writer. Oh, thank you, sir. Um, no, we, yeah. we worked together a lot. I mean, we did we did Family initially, I think, was the first thing we did, right? And then we did we did Doctor, Doctor Who, Who. Yeah. Um, for, for, for Titan for a while. And uh, and again, I thought we I thought we did some cracking stuff on Doctor Who. That's some of the best stuff of my career, I think. Weirdly, I, I yeah. absolutely agree. And when um, you stopped doing it, I was like, eh, I'm out. <laughs> yeah. It was, um, and then we did we did Kingsman for um, yep. that was uh, fun too. For, for Miller World, for Mark, so yeah. We 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 we've, we've been we've been together a long time now, Michael. Yes, it's true. It's a relationship, and it, it's it's very hard to find. I, I I mean, I find that I'm most happy working with writers I like a lot, and that's Rob. Well, Rob's one of them. The other Robbie is the other one, and um, I, I'm doing a book now with um, Martin Miller, who's the guy I worked with when I first started comics. He and I did a book thirty odd years ago, and we're now talking about doing another one. And like we've been talking about doing one for those thirty years. And it's like, finally, we're going to go, like, yeah, why not just do a self-published thing? Let's do a Kickstarter self-published graphic novel and see how that goes. Because, yeah, we still talk all the time. Um, and we're friends. And I understand the core of everything he does. His characters make all complete emotional sense to me. And that's a very rare thing, I find. Um, cherish it. And with a character like Hershey, I mean, Rob, you, you, you've already said, you know, this might not be the end, even though it's her death. Uh, is 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 this a character that actually you'd like to revisit? Whether it's a flashback tale or you know, because um, I, I guess this is this is the this is also the moment to to talk about. Um, yeah, I can see where poison. you're coming with it. Yeah. Well, yeah. So basically, what was um, no one's asked the question all the way through. Like, like when when John Wagner initially wrote that, like her, she had contracted this deadly alien pathogen that was killing her. It was like, well, she went off to another world for a while when she was um, she was sent away from the city, um, and she went off to another colony. And when she came back, she goes, oh, I've got this alien pathogen, and I'm dying. And it was never really explained at all what happened and how and who. And so that's the story we're telling. So it felt like the right time to do it off the back of the end of Hershey. Uh, we're doing uh, an eight-part series uh, called Judge Dread Poison, uh, which is uh, drawn by PJ Holden and it's coloured by Pete Doherty, and it is uh, a whodunit, and it's dread basically getting the news that her she has died in Antarctic City, and dread looking into it and kind of trying to track down the person who actually poisoned and killed her she, and and someone who again I I I like the fact that it's kind of it's got a little sort of weird little Hitchcockian sort of vibe to it, I think, is how I've thought of this one. It's um, it's a very, very long-winded murder. Someone poisoned her, and she lasted a good few years, basically, but someone did. So um, it's... And I thought it'd be fun to do a story... Because Dredd's a cop, right? But most of the time, the, the, the Dredd being a cop, we see him, you know, busting jaws and shooting people and kicking down doors and all those kind of things. But I thought, well, let's do one where he's a detective. And um, so it's it's a detective story. Excellent. Looking forward to it. 
And that uh, that kicks off in 2080 Prog 2351. Right. Which is our jumping on issue. Uh, so all new stories um, starting at the same time, which is very exciting. Um, and that's out on the 27th of September. Um, yeah. And I, I, like I say, I should say much like in, in tone of sort of Hershey, it's kind of, when we, when we were talking about it, I talked to PJ about it and I said, I suggested Pete Doherty to color it because Pete's a really good colorist. And I wanted a real kind of, again, cinematography, you know, a certain tone to this piece, basically. And and PJ and Pete have done that in spades. It's uh, it's it's quite noir, and um, and it goes to some interesting places. It's um, it's a little road movie around the dread, the dread universe, where as dread goes searching for who did this. Excellent, excellent. Well, I look forward to that. Oh, I I I've, I've, I've kept you both too long, um, but um, thank you for chatting about uh, uh, the Hello. end of Hershey, which is... To be celebrated, you said. Well, yeah, yes. apparently, uh, yeah, at the beginning I said celebrate. Uh, did not mean that. <laughs> marking, marking, not celebrating. Um, but, it, I mean, it's a fantastic final episode, uh, and uh, I shed a tear. Um, it was that, that last panel where, um, as she's dying and is wandering off into the light... Um, and it just turns, and because someone, you know, a voice says "mom," so she turns, and you see her at her prime, and yeah. that was, yeah, that was very touching. It, all, it also, you know, I, I, um, I did that reel for Instagram, um, with like the interstellar music, but all right. the piano in the background, and like you put that on anything, and it will draw a tear. Mm-hmm. Um, but particularly when you like show because those 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 wonderful um. Uh, panel side that you did with 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 her as a child and then as a teenager and then as chief judge and then leading into you know basically her in bed crying with pain um so when you're laying those images over and it's you know a life well lived <laughs> so yeah it was uh yeah very we all, um we all shed a tear yeah, yeah. but no it's um it's been sad but it's been it's been some um I think it's been some good work, and um, uh, and uh, I'm, you know, I'm glad it's over. And now, death for the creator. Something completely different. No, now, now we Logan's run it, and we are sent into the great whirling <laughs> carousel of 2000 AD creators, where we will explode. Definitely, yes. looking forward to that. Good, good, excellent. Not before anyway. time. Grill. Thank you to Rob and to Sai for chatting away about the the end of Barbara Hershey. Uh, I uh, what an incredible character uh, and what an incredible journey over the last forty odd years. So uh, uh, I had a little weep on the final uh, episode of uh, of the last series, and uh, I'm sure many other people have too. Um, so uh, thank you for tuning in to this uh, sudden burst of activity on the 2080 podcast. Um, we. we not going back to our regular uh, schedule, um, but I'm going to try and get an episode out uh, roughly uh, once a month um, talking about uh, the upcoming stuff from uh, 2000 AD and, and also Treasury of British Comics. Let's not forget that. Um, while we're here, let's talk about some of the absolute bizarre jazz things that are coming up in oh, the near future. Oh, my God. So many things. Ah. Oh um so uh, it's uh quite it's going to be quite a busy uh autumn and winter for us at the 2018 nerve center um coming uh right, or already out uh best of thugs terror tales um you've got mark miller rich delson al ewing chris weston loads of other people in there as well um this is uh horror inspired a uh, future shocks uh, essentially, and uh, absolutely stunning stuff in there. I can see uh, um, uh, just uh, sort of flicking straight through. You've got some, uh, yeah, Chris Weston. Um, you've got uh, Edmund Bagwell, of course, uh, David Hitchcock, Tom Foster, PJ Holden, Eric Bradbury. I mean, you know, some real classics in there. Moving on, we've got the, uh, the colour 
version of uh, Robo Hunter Verdus, uh, otherwise known as Planet of the Robots. This was the coloured version um, that was brought out uh, in uh, America in the 1980s. A real favourite. Fiends of the Eastern Front. Now, if if you know Fiends of the Eastern Front, then I'm preaching to the choir. If you have not read this, pick up this collection. Seriously, Earthlings is fantastic. Um, Nazis versus Vampires. Um, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> not too many spoilers in that. But this isn't just the uh, original series by Joe Finley Day and uh, Carl Suscoe, a fantastic original series, but also the follow-up. Um, series. So you've got David Bishop and Colin uh, McNeil um, doing um, uh, uh, Golems in uh, Stalingrad. Um, you've also got uh, the amazing 1812 by Dave Taylor and Ian Edgington, uh, which is just absolutely beautiful. You've also got um, uh, Dave Kendall in there, Danny, Hannah Berry, um, really, really great uh, collection. So you want to pick that up. What else have we got coming up? The Treasury of British Comics Annual. Again, don't sleep on this one. Earthlets, really great collection of uh, some brand new stuff, absolutely, but also some uh, some forgotten classics from the uh, Treasury of British Comic Ar uh, Comics Archive. Um, gorgeous. Henry Flint cover, but it also has uh, the David Roach web shop exclusive hardcover, uh, both of which are available from the Treasury in 2000 AD uh, web shops. Uh, and then this, if you've not seen this on our social media, um, prepare yourselves. Join If you're listening to this, go and have a look at, uh, at, at, at this chat on YouTube. Nemesis the Warlock, the definitive edition uh this is the web shop hardcover and it's very beautiful so this is um i, I think i'm right in saying this is like the biggest edition of nemesis uh that's uh, ever been done beautiful gold foil shiny cover and on the back as well uh Gemma sheldrake who's one of our uh designers uh done an absolutely bang up job with this and um inside not only have you got uh pages showing uh, some of Kevin O'Neill's um, sketches of uh, the Blitzspear, of Nemesis. You've got uh, colour covers uh, beautifully restored and uh, where the Reaper graphics were lacking in previous editions, there's been rescans of um, uh, the original film some of this so i just it's just gorgeous it's just absolutely gorgeous there is the the uh also the paperback edition with this uh wonderful quite shiny um kev o'neill cover um if you haven't listened to our massive uh kevin o'neill interview uh then uh Please go along to our YouTube <laughs> or find it on your podcast provider. Um, uh, much missed. Uh, you know, it's coming up to a, a year since uh, since we lost him. Um, but uh, yeah, it, it, a, a remarkable talent. And and the this uh, this new collection of of his and Pat Mills's nemesis is a real testament to uh, uh, to his legacy. So that that that's wonderful. So those are the books. Some of the books that we've got coming out. Um, in the next few months, um, I guess stay tuned for for more from the Galaxy's Greatest Podcast in the future. Earthlets, um, it's uh, really lovely to be back, and thank you for for bearing with us. Um, please do tell your friends, reviews, uh, spreading the word, uh, all sorts of uh, is 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 very welcome, uh, and uh, does help us get back on our feet as a podcast so uh, thank you to uh, anyone who uh, who helps do that um and until the next time earthlets um splendid worth rig and thanks very much
Thank you for listening to the 2080 Thrillcast, the galaxy's greatest podcast. Be sure to subscribe on the podcast provider of your choice and like and subscribe on YouTube. And why not delve into our huge back catalogue of interviews with many of the creators that make 2000 AD truly Zar Jazz. Thanks again, Earthlets. See you next time.